And now we turn to Asia, where North Korea claims it has successfully test-fired new cruise missiles. Our next guest, Matthew Pottinger, focused on Asia before becoming President Trump's deputy national security advisor. Here he is speaking to Walter Isaacson about the threats to the region and why he resigned from the White House after the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Thanks, Christiane and Matt Pottinger. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Walter. Great to be with you. We're just learning on the news today that North Korea is again testing long-range missiles. What does that mean? What should we be doing? Yeah, you know, uh, I, I think that uh, North Korea is watching um, uh, the the mistaken, you know, the mistake of, of the Biden administration of moving forward uh, with with trying to negotiate again with Iran uh, on Iran's terms. I think they've seen uh, this withdrawal from Afghanistan. Um, they've seen us make unilateral concessions to Russia uh, since President Biden has come into office. Th this, this one mystified um, a, a lot of the people that I work closely with. Why, why would we allow Russia to build, for example, uh, against the wishes of Congress and against uh, the, the wishes of our European allies, with the exception of Germany? Why would they allow Russia to build a, a gas pipeline straight into the heart of Europe, bypassing Ukraine. Uh, you know, so I think that Kim Jong-un is a savvy character. He watches what, what we're doing. He watches how we're doing uh, in other parts of the world and then makes, uh, you know, calculations about whether he wants to go back to an old playbook. But, but you and the Trump administration tried pretty hard to engage him to actually negotiate with him personally, right? I'm not, I, I'm not, I, I'm not against engaging uh, 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 dictators uh, particularly at their level. My view is that you're better off going leader to leader than, than going through the charade of having a bunch of mid-level diplomats uh, spend years negotiating an agreement that, that uh, dictators end up uh, you know, reneging on 10 minutes later. I'm, I'm not against the idea of, of us engaging with dictators. But what I, what I have a problem with is when we make unilateral concessions in, in the expectation that dictators are then going to treat us fairly. That's, that's just not how those systems work. So I, I think we might be moving back towards this pattern, which we had uh, been able to short circuit. At the end of 2017, we had applied so much economic pressure through the UN uh, 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 Security Council, economic pressure in the form of sanctions on North Korea, that their nuclear and long-range missiles uh, tests stopped uh, at the end of 2017. And, uh, you know, it's, it's been almost you know, whatever, four years uh, since they've started again. He may be now testing the waters again to see whether he can provoke in a way that would le that would lure the Biden administration into going back to the the pretty stupid <laughs> uh, pattern that we that we followed for thirty years of of mid level negotiations that take years involve us giving significant concessions only for us to be disappointed in in the uh, final result. So you were a Marine, two tours in Afghanistan. First of all, what do you make of our withdrawal from Afghanistan? Well, I, the, 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 the way in which we've withdrawn has uh, dealt a, uh, a, a grave blow uh, to our standing. There, there's no question about that. When we, we, we see uh, our European partners, uh, in some cases, censuring the president of the United States um, I, I, I think it's been painful for, for veterans, certainly, uh, to watch. And many of us have been engaged in trying to get people out of Afghanistan who, uh, who worked uh, uh, most closely with us to try to establish a, a, a viable government there. Uh, so, so certainly the short-term impact has been, has been quite grave. Medium, longer-term impact is a much tougher, uh, much tougher guess, right? Uh, we, we know that this has done damage to India. Uh, India, in a certain respect, now that the Taliban has taken over uh, most of Afghanistan, in, in some respects, India is now having to worry about two Pakistans on its, on its uh, northern uh, flank. Uh, we, we don't want um, uh, India to be encumbered uh, by, by additional threats of terrorism because we need India as a partner to uh, help counterbalance China's ambitions. Uh, throughout the region. So that's that's on the negative side. Uh, the, the Biden administration has tried to describe this as 
uh, our withdrawal from Afghanistan is an opportunity to double down on the Western Pacific region and to ensure that, that Southeast Asian countries, Pacific uh, countries, Japan, Australia, uh, South Korea remain independent and strong and safe from China's ambitions, not to mention Taiwan. So I, I'm hopeful that the Biden administration follows through on, on, uh, on uh, proving that, uh, that our loss in Afghanistan will be our gain somehow uh, in the Western Pacific. But it was the Trump administration with you as deputy national security advisor and Trump as president who uh, set a time to get out of Afghanistan. Was that a mistake? Well, you know, I, I, I think that we saw um, a, a timeline set multiple times, and then we were able to push that timeline out contingent upon the, the Taliban actually making good on the promises that it made in that agreement. So uh, you're saying Trump would have pushed it out and not followed the accord that he signed? I, I, th I think you'd have to ask him. I, I, I think that there's a uh, there were earlier, uh, there were ambitions during the Trump presidency to get out earlier than we did. You know, we Trump finished his term without having uh, completely gotten out. Were it's you among not, those pushing not to get out too quickly? Yeah, my, my view was that a uh, keeping um, several thousand troops uh, in, in and again, in sort of a background role where they're providing support, we're providing money and expertise and contractors who are able to keep equipment and aircraft up in the air and to provide uh, the all-important close air support from from the U.S. Uh, Air Force and Navy um, would would uh, allow us to buy time. It wasn't going to win this war in the in 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 the you know as defined at various points over the course of that twenty-year conflict. At certain points, we thought that we could completely defeat the Taliban uh, and establish a uh, you know a sovereign centralized uh, democracy. I think that that is a pipe dream uh, that that would continue to be a pipe dream uh, even if we had stayed. But uh, Afghanistan, um, you know, we don't need for Afghanistan to become you know a Western European democracy. In, in order for us to help protect uh, ourselves, we just need Afghanistan to be uh, a better Afghanistan than, uh, than certainly- Well, let me make sure I understand are. this. I mean, when you said you would have kept a few thousand troops indefinitely, Trump basically went against that advice, right? Yeah, I, I mean, the agreement that was signed said that we were gonna get out completely in May, uh, assuming that the Taliban uh, work towards a, a, a you know a unity government, a partnership that, that they would reach through negotiation, not through the barrels of their guns, and also that they would no longer support um, Al Qaeda. Now we, we've just seen that uh, the leader of Al Qaeda, uh, Ayman al Zawari, who we've not heard from for a very long time, they've just released Al Qaeda's just released a video by him. I, I think that that is a, a hint of what's to come. I don't think that those links between the Taliban and Al-Qaeda have been severed, far from it. I think we're gonna learn the hard way that uh, uh, you know, in coming months, that Al-Qaeda is gonna be back in business. So was that uh, disengagement agreement for this May that Trump had done, was that a uh, mistake? I, I, I think that, the, that uh, it hadn't yet been fulfilled on the part of the, uh, of the Taliban. So uh, it, would have been, it would have been a mistake to get out uh, in May, uh, given uh, where, where the Taliban was in reality and, and what they were failing to do to keep up their side of that bargain, yeah. Uh, President Biden and China President Xi Jinping a few days ago had a conversation, went on for an hour and a half, and it was not really a great conversation. Uh, for years, we thought engagement with the Chinese and economic engagement with Disney and Apple uh, would help make the, our relationships with China good. Was that a flawed thesis? Yeah, I, I think it was, and it's it's one that a lot of us all subscribe to, if we're honest with ourselves. We had a bipartisan, uh, really whole of society consensus that uh, at the end of the Cold War, with our success and triumph in that Cold War, that it was inevitable that China was going to have to liberalize over time as well, and that we could hasten that liberalization by engaging with China. And it was a, it was a uh, it, it was big hearted. It was optimistic. Uh, and it, it was also a little bit arrogant, uh, and unfortunately, it turned out to be wrong. Uh, we thought that by opening up our markets, uh, providing capital, training China's uh, uh, entrepreneurs and uh, scientists and military officers 
and, and, and government technocrats that uh, we, we would hasten this liberalization uh, of their markets at first. And we hoped over time, we'd make their system a bit more pluralistic as well, the political system. Uh, we, we, we now know, you know, uh, 20, 30 years on, it's been 20 years since China entered the World Trade Organization, that China is, is not only not liberalizing anymore, it's actually moving backwards towards uh, an earlier era. You know, I've watched your career ever since you were a Wall Street, great Wall Street Journal reporter in China and through many things, the Marine Corps. Tell me, why did you join the Trump administration? Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I'm, I swore an oath when I became a Marine uh, to the Constitution of the United States. And uh, that's my that's my North Star, you know. And, uh, you know, I, I, I believe that when the uh, President of the United States asks you to serve, um, uh, you, 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 your default uh, decision has got to be to say yes. Um, I, I'm really proud of uh, my service in the Trump administration. I'm very proud of the foreign policy uh, that came out of the Trump administration. I think it's been undervalued uh, in, uh, you know, sort of mainstream discourse. And over time, um, I think people are going to realize that uh, some, of, some of the things that we achieved with a paradigm shift on our approach to China uh, strengthening NATO uh, in in reality, even though we we were tough on NATO rhetorically, we, we were able to extract uh, uh, you know hundreds of billions of of additional dollars over over the course of a decade uh, for uh, European countries to stand up for their defense. And then you've got things like the Abraham Accords. I mean, that would have been a that would I mean, if that had been a, a different administration that had achieved uh, you know peace between Israel and and multiple uh, Sunni Arab uh, uh, you know, monarchies, uh, I, I, that, that would have been a pretty big story, I, I think, in, in a different administration. Um, so, you know, we pulled some rabbits out of the hat. In your foreign affairs piece, you talk about how China has now adopted a tactic, I think Russia had been using, of using our own social media to do things like spread conspiracy theories, spread what QAnon is saying undermine belief in vaccines, undermine uh, various ways, public health measures for COVID and vaccinations. How dangerous is that? And why haven't more Republicans uh, pushed back against these disinformation campaigns, much of which, uh, according to your piece, are being amplified by China to undermine our country? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that um, authoritarian governments uh, are looking at our uh, social media platforms as a golden opportunity for them to influence American uh, populations uh, and the populations of other free societies. Uh, and so the Russians, but the Chinese now, it, probably with even greater resources than the Russians applied, have banned all of our platforms in their own borders, but are now energetically using them for both overt propaganda, but also covert propaganda that makes use of um, uh, algorithms uh, and bots and proxies uh, that, that try to create the illusion of organic, real citizen uh, discourse, when in fact it is highly orchestrated discourse designed to do a number of things. And you've mentioned some of them. One of them is, is designed to find those areas where there are uh, divisions in our society, or at least cracks, and to try to tap wedges into those cracks. Uh, they're, they're trying to you know, uh, amp up uh, division and and uh, controversy. Another area is simply to try to uh, cause Americans to lose faith in our system of government, even though uh, our system of government, for all of its flaws, ha has worked pretty darn well and a hell of a lot better than uh, China's system of government governance has worked for its people. Remember, the Communist Party has only been in power for seven decades in China, they've killed roughly 50 million of their own people through uh, abuse uh, by uh, Mao Zedong, uh, through the Great Leap Forward, through the Cultural Revolution. And uh, many people fear that we may be sliding back into an era where, because all decisions are now being made by one man at the top, if, if that one man at the top makes a mistake, that's going to reverberate through society in ways that can be extremely disruptive and, and even uh, deadly. So uh, they're trying to cause people to, to doubt 
uh, that our system of government can deliver. And so I, I, I actually give credit to President Biden for having uh, spoken out repeatedly about the idea that this is really, a, in some respects, an ideological competition that we're in. It's about, as he's put it, whether democracy is still going to prove itself and refresh itself uh, to continue to be the greatest hope for humanity, or whether we're going to allow this, this uh, flowing tide of authoritarianism uh, to, uh, to corrupt our, our systems and undermine our sovereignty. So do you think that President Trump and maybe some of his enablers or supporters also help spread dis disinformation, whether it be on COVID or even about the election? Well, I think, I, I think that uh, the, the election uh, outcome uh, was litigated and uh, judges, uh, some of them appointed by President Trump himself, came out with, uh, with, with uh, their determination on, on the outcome. And that led uh, to uh, President Biden being, being the president. I think that we have to realize that uh, part of uh, holding the Constitution is, is to live by uh, the three branches of our government. And when judges determine that the election has come out a certain way, you've got to respect that. And we move on. Uh, so you're saying Trump really should quit saying that the election was stolen? Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't think that, um, uh, th that, that we can say that the election was stolen when, uh, under our system, judges determined that uh, you know, the outcome came out the way it did. That, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't find ways to improve uh, our election system so that everybody can have confidence that, that our elections are, are free and fair. Uh, and I, we've obviously got a lot of work to do on that, and, and I hope we move forward with that in a very bipartisan way. But, but um, you, uh, you quit, you resigned from the Trump administration the day after the assault on the Capitol. Was that because you were worried about the threats of democracy that had been happening there and because the administration had helped stoke some of that? I, I, I resigned on the 6th, uh, the afternoon uh, of, the, uh, of those protests. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I, I felt just given the events of that day that uh, it was appropriate for me to leave. Matt Pottinger, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Walter. It's great to be with you.